All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to today's Tech Talk. I have the pleasure of introducing Randy Shoup. He has a great career that spans 25 years working at companies like eBay, Google, startups, and more recently is the VP of Engineering at Stitch Fix, where he has had a ton of experience in um, services architectures and now, of course, moving monoliths to microservices. So please uh, give a warm welcome to Randy. Thanks. This is Thanks, this is great. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, yeah, Michelle and I um, were having a conversation a couple months ago in New York at a conference I helped organize, and she said, hey, would you ever come and talk microservices to my team at Cerner? And I said, you're in Kansas City, right? And I said, you guys have really good barbecue and really good jazz. She says, yeah, like if you can make that happen, I'm here. And so several months later, here we are. Um, I'm going to do my part, and then I'm counting on Michelle to do the other, the other two parts uh, later. Uh, which we've already organized, so we're all good. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, so as Michelle said, I'm currently the VP of Engineering at Stitch Fix. Uh, who's heard of Stitch Fix just for, yeah, that's a lot of people, that's great. Um, so we're a clothing retailer. I'm gonna tell a little bit about the things that we do with data science to help find people the clothes that they love. Um, but it's a fun place to work. I've been there for about two years. Um, we, when I joined, we were 25 engineers, now we're 125, and so I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that um, we've done along the way. Uh, before Stitch Fix, I was sort of a roving CTO as a service, my friends used to say. Um, I uh, helped smaller companies and larger companies um, break up monoliths, figure out what they would do with their architecture, uh, refactor their organizations, all that kind of stuff. Some of the things we're going to talk about here. Uh, earlier, I was director of engineering at Google for Google App Engine. So that's Google's platform as a service, like, I don't know, Heroku or, or Cloud Foundry or Engine Yard or something like that. And there are three million different applications worldwide that run on App Engine, including uh, Snapchat and uh, Pokemon Go and a few other you might have heard of. Um, and then earlier, uh, I, I was at eBay for about six and a half years as the chief engineer, um, and I was responsible mostly for eBay's search engine, um, but I also saw more broadly the change of eBay's architecture from sort of one generation to the next, and I can talk a little bit about that. Um, first, a little bit about Stitch Fix, because that will help to motivate why we care about data and why microservices are a good fit for what we do. Um, so uh, Stitch Fix is sort of the opposite of a standard clothing retailer. So we don't have you come shop on our site, but what if instead you had an expert to choose clothes for you? So instead you fill out a really detailed profile about yourself. So you ask, we ask you like 70 or 80 questions. It might take you 15 or 20 minutes to fill out. So size, height, weight, age, occupation, are you a parent? Um, do you like to flaunt your arms? Do you like to hide your hips? Um, those kinds of, you know, borderline personal questions we ask, why? Not because we want to get in your business, but because if there's somebody in your life that knows how to choose clothes for you, like maybe it's you or maybe it's, you know, a spouse or a friend or a sibling, like what does that person explicitly or implicitly know about you? And why or do they choose the things that they would choose that you really like to wear? And so we ask you those things explicitly, and I'll talk a little bit about what we do with that information in a moment. So you get five handpicked items for you in the mail. Um, they're handpicked for you by an actual person, so we have 3,500 of them all around the United States. You keep the things that you like, and you're going to pay us for those, uh, but you return the other ones for free. So that is the, you know, the overall business model. That's what you'd talk to the, you know, the venture capitalists about. Um, but there's a lot of data science and engineering behind it. So we actually have a near one-to-one -one ratio between data science and engineering. And so as I mentioned, we have about 125 software engineers on the team that I work on. And we also have 80, 80 data scientists that work at Stitch Fix. So that ratio of nearly one-to-one -one engineer to data science is, we believe, unique in the world. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be. It'd be fine if there were other companies that you know, had the same commitment as we do. Um, but we have yet to find those companies. Um, and what do we do with those data scientists? Uh, everything. So we apply intelligence to really every aspect of the business. So we're a physical retail business. We physically buy clothes. We physically store them in our warehouses. And we physically ship them through the mail. So we have people that buy the clothes. And we figure out, they figure out what clothes to buy. And we have a ton of data science and tooling that helps those people figure out what to buy, when, in what size breakdown, and what warehouses should they live in, et cetera. Uh, inventory management about um, when, a, uh, when a picker, when somebody picks those five items in your box, 
uh, and they walk through the warehouse, that's actually an instance of the traveling salesman problem, right? So they're, we're randomly, you know, uh, traversing through this uh, this uh, sea of different possible, you know, cities in the traveling salesman, and that if you probably, you know, the computer scientist, uh, the computer scientist here will know that's an NP-complete problem, like it's actually computationally intractable, um, particularly when you go as we have done from picking one box at a time to five boxes at a time. So the tw 25, uh, uh, the path of 25 uh, pickings through the warehouse is pretty, pretty difficult. Anyway, we apply data science to that problem. We apply it to the styling recommendation problem. What do we recommend on your behalf to the stylist, which I'll talk about more in a moment. And then also things like demand prediction. So again, we're a physical business. And so unlike the Ebays and the Googles of the world, which are virtual businesses, where if we had 2x the n amount of customer load, that would be a reason for a party. If we have 2x the number of customers than we predict at Stitch Fix, it's a disaster. Why? Because we only have half the clothes that uh, we need. We only have half the number of stylists, half the number of warehouses and warehouse employees. Does it make sense? Cool. Uh, and so in all these things, the model is have the machines do what the machines do best, and then the humans do what the humans do best. So here's how the styling function works. So again, styling is choosing those five items that are going to go in the box that we send to you. So from your perspective, like, you imagine that Stitch Fix has a bunch of inventory, which we do, and then magic happens, and then they get sent to you, and it shows up in a box. Um, well, there are two parts to that, um, a lot of which involves engineering. So we actually do have a ton of inventory, and then we, do, we, we run a ton of machine-learned models uh, all the time to compute a score of what you might like. So in particular, we take every day, we take every piece of inventory times every client, and we compute a predicted probability of purchase. What is the conditional likelihood that if we send Randy this fleece, he will keep it? So, I don't know, 62% chance for this fleece, 57% uh, chance for the shirt, 44% chance for the shoes, something like that. And those scores are made up as an ensemble approach, if you know machine learning. So there are a bunch of individual sub-models that are predicting individual factors like size and style and so on. And then we ensemble that up into a, into a score. Uh, great, so those algorithmic recommendations are surfaced to a stylist. And the way we think about it is we think about the stylist's job as cu curating those recommendations. Does it make sense? So we have an expert stylist that curates them, puts together an outfit, um, answers a request that you might have, like, um, I'm going to an evening wedding in Manhattan, send me something appropriate. Uh, and if you're a woman, you know, the stylist is like, slinky black dress. But the machine doesn't know that yet. So, uh, and also the machines don't know how to put an outfit together either. So that's a thing that, you know, we're working on, but it's, uh, the combinatorics are really challenging, so whatever. Okay, so now a box end up, ends up on your doorstep, you know, serviced by data science. Great. So the genesis of the rest of this talk um, is a little bit from my like CTO as a service days. So I would get these questions. I would hear people say, hey, tell us how you did things at Google and eBay, because that's where I worked. And I would say, sure, I'll happily tell you, but you have to promise not to do them. Now, why did I say that? Not because what Google and eBay are doing is wrong, but because uh, it's not necessarily appropriate for the five-person startup or even the 150-person startup. Does it make sense intuitively? Like the kinds of things that are gonna work for a 15,000 engineer organization, which is Google, versus 150 versus 15, like those are just different orders of magnitude of problem. So I'm gonna tell a little bit about some companies that you've heard of and how they started in a monolithic way and ended up in a microservices way. So eBay, depending on how you count, is probably on its fifth complete rewrite of its architecture. So uh, famously, it started as uh, a monolithic Perl application that the uh, founder, Pierre Omidyar, wrote um, over the Labor Day weekend in uh, 1995. So he came home from his job at Adobe at the time and was wanted to learn about this new cool thing called the web, uh, and he built the thing that ended up becoming eBay. And he wasn't intending you know, to build a business out of it, um, but he was trying to learn about web technologies and, and play around. Uh, so that was the first version of eBay. The next version was a monolithic C++ application, which at its worst was 3.4 million lines of code in a single DLL. Uh, they were hitting compiler limits on the number of methods per class, which is 16K. Yeah, 
So if you feel like you have a monolith, maybe you could you know, sleep better because there are actually people that you know, are far worse, uh, I'm sure. Uh, the next iteration was a rewrite in Java, um, and it was, you really couldn't call it microservices, but more mini applications, right? So there'd be an application for the selling part of the site, the buying part, the, the search part, et cetera, times about 220 different, uh, different applications. Uh, and now it's fair to characterize eBay as a polyglot set of microservices. Twitter's gone through a similar evolution. So Twitter started famously as the world's biggest Rails application, which they codenamed what? The monorail. I love it. Um, the next generation was breaking the front end out into um, a little bit more JavaScript, the back end out into services. Um, Twitter was a really ad early adopter of Scala, so mostly written in Scala in the early days. Uh, and now you can call Twitter a, a polyglot set of microservices. Amazon has gone through a similar evolution. So um, it started as a monolithic Perl and C++ application, which you can actually still see evidence of in some older URLs. So if you ever see Obidos, O-B-I-D-O-S in one of the URLs, that was the code name of Amazon's original monolithic uh, application. And they keep the URLs around because of uh, search engine optimization and because they've got a lot of page rank associated with these pages um, and they wanna, they wanna keep that around. So the next generation um, was a, a rewrite and service-oriented architecture. And the brilliance of Jeff Bezos, and I say this as a competitor because I'm a retailer, a competitor of Amazon, like the great brilliance that he has was they basically, their engineering teams basically went dark from 2000 to 2005. And it's hard to remember given how amazing Amazon is today, but they were actually not super successful as a business during that period. I mean, they were, you know, they were growing, but not that fast. And Wall Street was really putting a lot of pressure on uh, Jeff Bezos in particular to produce more profit, more revenue. And he said, hold on, I'm retooling my engineering teams into a service-oriented architecture, go away. Uh, and they did. And he finished that work, and look what's happened since, right? A year later, they, they did the first uh, uh, service, uh, S3, in uh, Amazon Web Services. That is now a standalone business, as I learned last week, a standalone business worth $18 billion, just AWS, growing, I don't remember what it is currently, but last year it was growing at 50% a year, so probably something similar to 50% a year. That's not too bad. And that's, oh, by the way, not even the retail site itself. So uh, Amazon has got a, huge, uh, got a huge business benefit from this technology choice that they make, that they made uh, moving to service-oriented architecture. And now, again, it's fair to characterize uh, Amazon as a polyglot set of microservices. Um, is there a pattern here? Is there a pattern here? Yes, there is. Awesome, great. Uh, the pattern is twofold. No one starts with microservices, but past a certain scale, which legitimately not everybody's gonna, meet, get, gonna be there, right? So maybe 95% of companies aren't gonna be you know, 15,000 engineers, um, but past a certain scale, almost everybody has co-evolved to something that feels and looks like microservices. So I wanna say two things about that. First, I'm gonna let Martin Fowler, the guy who wrote Refactoring and brilliant, uh, brilliant guy in our industry, uh, I love this. The first law of distributed object design is don't distribute your objects. So if you don't need to build a, a distributed system, please don't. Um, but my sense from my talking to the various people that I've talked with here already, you guys are far past that scale and you actually do need to think about that stuff and therefore we'll finish the rest of the talk and we'll talk about how to do uh, microservices in an effective way. Um, but here's what I like to say. If you don't end up regretting your early technology decisions, you probably over-engineered. So there might well have been an, e an eBay competitor or an Amazon competitor in 1995 that uh, instead of uh, uh, delighting their early customers and building a, uh, an MVP and like finding a new business model and so on. Um, instead of di doing that, they built a distributed system because like we're going to need that in five years, so we better get started now. Um, if that were true, if, if such a company exists, there's a reason why we have not heard of them, right? Because they did not spend their uh, rare and precious development effort on the things that mattered in the early stage. And now once you're you know, in a scaling or hyper, hyper growth phase, now you have to start thinking about what's an architecture that, that's gonna allow to us to continue to scale um, to further you know, orders of magnitude improvement. Does it make sense? Cool, all right. So microservices. So I like to say the micro in microservice is not about how many lines of code are in there or how long it takes to write, but it's about the scope of the interface. So a microservice should be single purpose, it should have a simple, well-defined interface, and it should be modular and independent. And if you are, look at me, I've been in this industry for a long time, um, 
If you have been in the industry for a while, you may have remembered that we had a first take at service-oriented architecture in 1990, and these look pretty right. Uh, those look like legit things that we would have done in 1990s. Um, I will assert that microservices, I mean, it's not my word, but it is the word in the industry right now, microservices are nothing more than service-oriented architecture done properly. You know, services that are well-designed, a simple domain model, um, they're modular and independent and composable. So the thing that we all know, not all, the thing that we, more of us know now than, and I'll say I didn't know in the 1990s when I first started doing services, was this thing, isolated persistence. So a failure mode among several of the people that tried and failed service-oriented architecture in the 90s was the idea of, I'm gonna have a bunch of services, but then I'm gonna share this sea of databases underneath, or maybe I'll share one monolithic database. Um, for lots of reasons, that's not a, uh, that's not a uh, strategy that's gonna be very successful long-term. Why? Uh, because if you can read and write my database behind my back, what sort of guarantees about um, invariance can I make in my business logic? Zero, right? If you can read and write my database behind my back without executing my business logic, there is nothing I can do, nothing I can guarantee through my front door. So um, how do I know this? Because eBay did exactly this. <laughs> so eBay in 2008, that was their like uh, version three and a half of the architecture that never kind of hit. Um, so eBay in 2008 uh, did a, an attempt at service-oriented architecture. eBay did have a sea of shared databases that all the applications were using directly. And so then a bunch of you know, very smart people, they were very well-designed services, they were implemented well and correctly. Um, nobody used them. Why? Because the applications could just continue to go to the shared databases and they didn't have to use the services for what they needed. Does it make sense? Yeah, and of course the services couldn't actually provide any added value exactly because everybody was going directly to the databases behind them. So it was this uh, chicken and egg, you know, no way to get out of this situation. And the services at that time were basically abandoned. Uh, okay, cool. Well, so what does, what does isolated persistence mean? Just very briefly. Um, so there are a couple of approaches you could do. I mean, one, the obvious approach is that a team that operates and owns and operates a particular microservice would also own and operate you know, their own database or their own data store. I mean, that's a legitimate thing, and we do that at Stitch Fix. Um, another approach is you might be able to use a multi-tenant persistent service that somebody operates on your behalf. And that somebody absolutely could be another team within Cerner, or it could be you know, somebody at Google or Microsoft or Amazon Web Services, right? Something like uh, Dynamo or Relational Database Service or something like that. Um, and the key thing is not which or wh whether you use the one or the other or something else, but the key idea is that the only way to get access to the data is through your published service interface. Does it make sense? Cool, all right. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about um, microservices, uh, the pros and cons to them. So the pros, you know, of course I'm gonna talk about them, so I will talk about the pros, but there are also cons, right? So the pros are that each individual unit is simple, um, we, probably not, we now probably know that you, know, you can independently scale them. That's one of the great advantages of, uh, of microservices. But also I think less appreciated is if you have drawn that uh, boundary in a simple way around your service, it's actually really easy to test them, right? Because they, they should be able to operate in, in isolation. Um, and so independently testing them, independently deploying them is another great advantage of, of doing things in microservices. And then again, maybe not as well appreciated now Versus when I have like this monolithic database that has all my, uh, all my uh, data in there, now it's possible to act actually introduce a caching layer uh, in a, like a consistent, you know, reasonable way. Um, if we were talking maybe, I don't know, I'm forgetting the, term, the timing, maybe eight years ago, the, you know, maybe the new hotness now is uh, you know, containers and maybe serverless. A couple years ago it was uh, NoSQL, before that it was data grids, right? So coherence, um, uh, 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 gigaspaces, there were a couple of these companies that would put this uh, caching layer in front of your database. And there's a, I mean, I, love, I genuinely like and respect the CTOs and smart people of all those companies. Like I know them, they're my friends. And also if they were sitting right here, they tried to attack an intractable problem, right? The intractable problem of I have this really complicated data model in my database and just sticking another thing in front of it and expecting it to like work, 
um, you're basically rep you're basically having, and if you want to do it cr properly, you have to replicate all the logic that's either in your application or in your database or both. And like, there's a reason why those companies are not used anymore, not because they didn't have smart people, but because they had smart people banging their heads against a problem that was like actually intractable. Uh, cool, all right. Uh, anyway, cons of microservices. So there are lots of reasons why we might want to stick with a monolith. Um, so one is that even though each unit is simple, there are a lot of cooperating units. So you have to think about you know, how, the, how the units interact with one another. Um, it can be nice to have a bunch of, like one monolithic repository where I have all my uh, big monolith code because if I do uh, you know, uh, refactoring in this sort of um, uh, cross, uh, part way, cross component way, it's really easy to do if there's a single repository, and that's harder to do in a microservices world, it just is. Um, it requires some more sophisticated tooling around dependency management, that's for sure. And then also, we've replaced our nice, comfortable, in-process latencies with ugly, failure-prone uh, network latencies. Does it make sense? Cool. So why in the world would we do this? Uh, I can think of three reasons. Uh, the first reason that I see is, uh, I'll call it feature velocity, it's the ability to continue to move fast. So warning signs include our time to market used to be X number of days or weeks or months, and now it is 2X or 4X or 5X, right? Because there's so much inner interplay between the components in our system, um, because it's so hard to be productive or to be safe uh, in the monolith. Uh, teams are stepping on each other's toes and having to coordinate things that you know would probably they shouldn't have had to coordinate. Um, the other warning sign that I've seen is when you have new, when you're trying to onboard new engineers onto the platform that it takes like months and months for them to do their first commit safely because um, they have to learn all the secret places where the bodies are buried and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I hear embarrassed laughter, like uh, I, I'm, I'm embarrassedly laughing with you because I've absolutely had that experience. I mean, not at Stitch Fix, we're young, so like we're way more a unicorn than a horse. So we, while we have legacy stuff, um, well look, we have actually legacy stuff. I'm, I'm, not, even gonna, I'm not even gonna uh, say that. We have, we have similar problems, to be honest. Um, but, but cool, I've had it worse, let's say it that way. Uh, great, another reason though is scaling. So one of the great reasons behind eBay's move from that monolithic C++ gargantuan thing to the Java thing was partly the feature velocity because it was difficult for everybody to be in literally the same class, like that wasn't comfortable. Um, but also uh, the eBay site was you know, uh, sc uh, scaling explosively um, and vertically scaling that monolith wasn't working. I mean in particular, um, the thing, uh, eBay had a monolithic database at the time as well, so it was an Oracle database as you had, and it was running on the absolute largest machine that Sun Microsystems would sell, like bigger than a refrigerator, um, and it's still a 72-way uh, thing. Like it was a pretty big machine, um, and still like it wasn't big enough. And so uh, I'm imagining the conversation with the Sun rep going, eBay's like, okay, give us the 2x larger one, and they're like, we don't have it. Uh, like you can wait five years, and so eBay's like, uh, okay, well we better uh, go back and like break that big database into two and four and then, and then smaller things. Um, so that scaling thing was absolutely a reason why uh, eBay had to do it. Uh, and also there's a little more subtler point which is when you have broken things up into smaller services, the different things can scale at different rates, right? So one hopes that once you have put your authentication and authorization system into place, you're hopefully not modifying it all the time, like you hopefully got it right-ish and then that's thing that's maybe slow changing, but, part, but your website is probably fast changing, and so it's weird to be redeploying your authentication system just to simply make a change in the JavaScript. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. All right, so the third reason, which is nobody's first reason that I found, but almost everybody's secondary reason, is the idea of being able to do uh, independent deployments, right? So parts of the system absolutely are faster changing and slower changing, and so that monolithic release schedule of like, really, I have to wait a month for my JavaScript change to go out? Like, that's no fun. Um, and so the ability to you know, break things down into services and allow individual services to deploy independently of each other is a, is a nice advantage. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, how we might break up this monolith, but I'll tell you one thing that you shouldn't do, and again, I'll use Martin Fowler because he's so clever. Um, the only thing a big bang migration guarantees is a big bang. Um, so I wouldn't recommend uh, this approach. I would recommend, however, an incremental approach that extracts services over time. Um, and you should have a long-term program, right? But the idea of 
and I hope nobody does this here, but like the idea of like, let's go dark for two years while we retool everything, and then we'll come up for air, and then we'll build new features. Like, no business, very few businesses survive that thing, and you never want to get, uh, you never want to get to that point. Okay, cool. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Stitch Fix's um, journey. So Stitch Fix absolutely today still has a monolithic database. We've been working on service extractions for a while and we've made some progress, but we still have a ways to go. Um, so our problem statement is that we, I mean, I don't show all the boxes and lines. We have about 70 or 80 applications and services. We have about, I don't know, 200 tables in the shared database on order of magnitude. And like everything interesting about our business model is in there, right? So clients, the boxes that we've shipped, every item that we have in inventory now and in the past, uh, all the metadata that we have about our items, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so all that information is in there. And what we want to do is we want to decouple applications and services from that shared database. Why? Again, it's because this is a scaling bottleneck. It's a performance uh, bottleneck. It's a single point of failure. All those things are reasons why we, we would want to do this extraction. So I'll talk very briefly about the pattern, but again, I'll try to reduce the number of boxes and lines. So let's imagine there are two applications and three tables. So the first step is to create a service around, let's say, clients, right? So that's what we call our customers. So maybe you would say patient. Um, so uh, we, we build a client service, which is hopefully a simple, well-defined interface around the things that we need to do about clients. That's going to use this client table in the shared database. Um, so the next step is to, and this is so easy, in the architecture diagram. Well, let's just simply point those lines from the applications to the service and all done. Um, no, I mean, legitimately, I'm, I'm saying that in that way because that's the hard part, right? That's the real work. That's the person months or person years worth of work, extracting out all the other places, all the other things that I need around clients, all the other tendrils in the database and elsewhere around that stuff. But uh, legitimately, this is the next step. Does it make sense? Like, you can't move forward in making that service a real thing until everybody uses the service and nobody goes behind the service's back. Does it make sense? All right, so this, it's not trivial. It's, it's not just moving some lines on a, on a diagram, um, but that is the next step. And there's a bunch of work that goes into that, of course. But then once we've done that, now we can extract that table out into a database that we associate uh, directly with the client service. Does that make sense? And only now. Like here, we're not done. We're not done at all. We created a service, but, and I don't wanna make people feel bad, but I'm talking to my team as well if they're watching, this is worse. We should, but if we were gonna leave it here, we should have just left it here. Why? Because this, where there is a service, oh sorry, this, where there is a, uh, this where there's a service and they're still using the table, you're still going behind the guy's back, um, that is all the problems of a monolith and all the problems of a distributed system. Yeah? Cool. So finished, the definition of done is this. That client table is out, and by out, I mean like nobody's using it, right? It's out, so you can't be secretly joining to it, you can't be secretly having it in transactions, et cetera. So this is done. All right, cool. So now, again, ha, this is so simple, let's just rinse and repeat and do it for everything else. So we've been successful with the client service, now we're gonna do the same thing with items and we're gonna create an item service, we're gonna uh, point all the applications to talk to that and then we're going to extract that table from the shared database and then we'll do the same thing for you know, metadata, so SKUs and styles. Does it make sense? Cool, and the thing I wanna emphasize here is what we started from the beginning is that these are actually the service boundaries. Right, the service boundary includes obviously the application, you know, business logic part, but it also includes that database that's owned there. So nobody should be able to, you know, pierce that barrier without going through the proper service interface. Does it make sense? Cool. Okay. You say, well, that sounds great, Randy, but like, it was pretty cool to have a monolithic database. There was lots of stuff I could do, and now you're taking all those things away. Well, I am but I'm gonna give you some of them back and some of them I can't give you at all, but we'll talk about what you can do instead. So uh, let's talk about, for the remainder of our time together, let's talk about how to do shared data, how to do joins, and how to do transactions, or more precisely, how to get some of the things we like about transactions, but not really transactions, okay? So the next, the thing I wanna give you, I'm gonna give you two pieces of architectural tools in your toolbox along the way. This is the first one. So uh, who would, well, I guess there's only one company here. 
in the conversations that I've had with you guys, you do use events, that is great, awesome. Um, I want to help you to think about events as a first class design thing uh, that you use when you're building something. So an event, according to Wikipedia, is a significant change in state. I like to think about it as a statement that something interesting occurred, right? So um, client checked out, item added, uh, order complete, um, address updated, something like that. So the traditional three-tier system that most of us have you know, cut our teeth building systems in for a while um, is, I think, great but incomplete. So we, you know, traditionally, we have a presentation tier, we have a sort of application or business logic tier, and we have a persistence or maybe you know, relational database tier. I think we are missing something if we don't have that fourth fundamental building block that is a uh, representation of a state change, right? Uh, and I'm going to call that an event. Um, and then what we'll have is we hope those to be asynchronous. So you know maybe nobody's listening to the events quite yet. Maybe somebody will later. Maybe one there's a one consumer of my event, or there might be many consumers in my system of this particular event. So all right, now let's take events and apply them to microservices. So I like to think of events as a first class part of the service interface. What do I mean? I mean, so the obvious part of the service interface is that front door, right? So whatever synchronous request response protocol you're using, so I don't know if it's REST and JSON, or gRPC, or uh, God help you, Corba, or uh, uh, a DCOM, or uh, SOAP, um, you know, these all exist in the world, but, but those are for sure part of your service inter interface. But um, I do also want you to uh, have, at least conceptually, the idea that any events that you produce, that's part of your interface. Every event that you consume, that's another part of your interface. And then any bulk reads and writes that you might do. So if you are bulk ETLing your data out of your database into an analytical system, that's conceptually part of your database, or your interface. That's a legit thing to do. We do that at Stitch Fix all the time. If you are bulk loading things, I don't know, from in batch from some external system, uh, that's another thing that is legitimately part of your interface. And the, the interface doesn't have to be the same. It doesn't have to be REST for everything. But you should be managing them in the same way. You should be thinking about Migrate, you know, migrating the, the schemas or the ways that you interact with those external systems in a similar backward compatible way. Cool. And so the way I like to think about it is my interface as a service is any mechanism that gets data into or out of the service. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Now we have most of the tools in our toolbox to talk about shared data, about joins, and about um, transactions. So the problem statement is this. In a monolithic database, it's really easy to leverage shared data. I just point at that green table, and I'm all good. But where does shared data go in a microservices world? So um, first, I want to add one more architectural tool in our toolbox, and then we'll answer the question. So the principle, the architectural principle I like to have here is that if there's a piece of data in your system that you care about, there should be one and only one place in your system, hopefully a service, that owns that thing, that is the canonical system of record for patient, for care provider, for, you know, in our, in our situation, customer or order or something like that. There is one and only one place in our system where we can, that, that owns customer. Now, there may be other, many other places that look at customer and use it for, for, their, for their work, but uh, every one of those other places in our system that references customer is a, and every one of these is important, is a read-only, non-authoritative cache of that data. So what do I mean by those words? It is, so clearly the billing service needs to know some information about customers, right? Like they need to know their billing address, they need to know things about them. Um, that billing service should not be the place that I go to update the customer's address, even if the billing service knows the address. Does it make sense? Like that's not the billing service's job, that's the customer service's job. So that's read only, and if the billing service were somehow allowed to be asked, hey, what's Randy's address? It might be able to return an answer, but that answer is non-authoritative, right? Like that answer is not the current address. That's the cached address that the billing service found the last time it looked. Does it make sense? Cool. So what I'm not saying is that there is only one place that has any reference to customer, but I'm saying there is one place, one system of record that actually owns the current view of the customer. All right, cool. So now that we have that, now we can talk about a couple of different approaches to share data. So first of three is just look it up synchronously. 
Like, there's nothing weird about this. This is totally legit. We do it all the time. So in this example, the customer service owns the customer data, and our fulfillment service that is going to ship boxes to people, like, it needs to know the customer's address, just like the billing system does. And so it could simply ask the customer service, hey, what's Randy's address? And then they return it, and it's good. Um, this is a totally legitimate strategy. There is nothing wrong with this. Um, sometimes it doesn't, it, it doesn't meet your needs. Um, so it could be that the fulfillment service is asking the customer service too often. You know, it, it puts a lot of load on the customer service. It might be that um, it takes too long for the customer service to respond, and maybe the fulfillment service doesn't want to wait. It might also be that you don't want to, um, to use a fancy architectural phrase, you don't want to couple the availability of the fulfillment service with the customer service. So what do I mean? You might want to be able to fulfill packages. I might want to be able to ship packages out even if the customer service is down. Does it make sense? Cool. So for any of those reasons, we might apply a different approach. So this approach, in this approach, still the customer service owns the customer information, right? Um, but the customer service is now producing events when interesting things happen to customers. So for example, maybe the customer service would produce an address updated event when the customer address changes. The fulfillment service would listen to that event and then remember locally the customer's address. Does it make sense? Cool. And actually, this has some nice properties. Like, it's possible that the customer service does not need to remember the history of the customer's addresses. But maybe the fulfillment service does. Like, maybe the fulfillment service would want to remember, oh, where are all the packages that we've sent over time for whatever reason? And they might remember that, OK, Randy used to live in San Francisco, and now he lives in Pacifica, and then he's going to move to Montara next month. Like, whatever, those kinds of things. Cool. Uh, hopefully, the house that I'm in the process of buying will come through. But all right. Uh, you can all hope with me, right? You're going to hope with me? Thanks. Great. Okay. Uh, third approach is for slow changing metadata, right? So I am mildly embarrassed, but fine to say this, that in our shared database, we actually have a table that is, here are the colors. Because they actually change over time. Because like we, you know, we started with uh, pink, and then oh, pink's not granular enough, so we have to add salmon, or we have to add, uh, you know, very uh, lighter pink and something like that. Um, that's a real thing when you're in in, in fashion retail. Uh, size schemas. So the idea of you know the women's numeric sizes, you know two, four, six, eight. That's what's called a size schema in retail. Um, small, medium, large, extra large is another one. Uh, waist sizes, waist and inseam sizes for men's pants. You know that's another schema. Anyway, those things are also currently represented in tables. Um, uh, the U.S. states. So I sure hope that you know as. Uh, Militant you may be in building services, but I hope that nobody has built the U.S. state service. We're like, what are the U.S. states? Here are the 50 U.S. states, Randy. Um, and that might change. You know, maybe Puerto Rico will hopefully become a state at some point. Maybe, you know, that will happen. Or maybe California will divide into six, as some people are proposing. Uh, not me. Um, but that could happen, and, but that's slow changing, and you're going to have a lot of warning before that happens, right? So, um, so I just use Ruby gem things here because that's the technology stack that we use, but you could imagine distributing this as code, right? You could imagine distributing a piece of code that says, here are the uh, IDs and the values for the colors that we use. Here are the fabrics. Here are the US states. That seems like a legitimate thing to do in code. Does it make sense? Cool. All right. Um, Let's keep going, and then maybe we'll, so we'll do uh, questions at the end, if that's all right. OK, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is joins, and then we will end up with talking about transactions. So the problem statement is this. Mono the monolithic database makes it really easy to join tables together. I simply you know, add another table to my from clause, and I'm good, right? From A, inner join B on join condition, all done, very simple. Uh, that's great. Um, but once I've split the data across microservices, this way of working isn't really available to me. So I have two techniques, and one is the very straightforward and obvious one of just syn synchronously computing the join in real time, right? So in this example, let's imagine we want to show our customers an order history page, and we might have to go to the customer service to find some information about customer, you know, to be able to show the her name or her address, something like that. And then we go to the order service with that customer ID, and we find all the orders that are associated with that customer. Does that make sense? This is every web mashup in the world, right? Every web page on the planet does this unless it all happens to come from like one service call. Does it make sense? Yeah. 
Great. So there's nothing weird about this. This is a legit thing that we do all the time. But again, maybe we would want to, this is a little bit weird in this example, but like maybe we would want to show the order history page even if the order service were down. Like that's a legitimate thing we might want. Um, and this, this way of working isn't going to do that. So instead, there's another strategy which I'll call materializing the view. Um, and I very intentionally use database terminology for this because hopefully it's familiar. Um, but there are other ways of, of using of other words for this concept as well. So the idea here is, let's imagine that the use case is, uh, okay, I'll take a step back. So at Stitch Fix, remember, we send boxes with five items in them. You keep some of them and you return others, and you can tell us why you kept them and why you returned them. So for every box we send out, we hope to get five pieces of feedback, or you know, five sets of feedback. Um, and so, and there is a, therefore, there is a many-to-many -many relationship between the items we have in inventory and the feedback we've gotten about them. Does it make sense? Like, we've sent this shirt out hundreds, maybe thousands of times, and then we've collected a whole bunch of feedback on that. And let's imagine we want to have a service um, that aggregates together that many-to-many -many relationship. So it looks at all the items, all the feedback, and, like, puts that together. Um, so the way we, a way we might do that is we might have the item service produce events when new items are added or maybe when item uh, metadata changes. Uh, we might have the order feedback service, like every time somebody returns uh, one of her boxes, you know, we, um, uh, we will remember the, the feedback and then we will produce events about, you know, those items feedback. And then we might be collect, we could collect those, listen to those events with our item feedback service and uh, sort of denormalize that join, materialize the view. I'm trying to use equivalent, uh, tr equivalent terminology um, in, in, our own, in our own persistence. So we're gonna maintain a you know, join of items and orders, and we're gonna maintain that denormalized in local storage. Cool. Uh, does this make sense? Does it seem like weird and overwrought and like maybe this is too complicated? Um, if, it is, if it does, it's okay, but I will try to disabuse you of that notion with some other systems that you use every day that do exactly this. So if you have a commercial grade enterprise database system, i.e. you pay for it, um, you probably have this materialized view as a way that you can uh, uh, configure things. Uh, most NoSQL systems on the, on the world, um, so if you use Cassandra or React or Voldemort, um, even Hadoop for that matter, um, most NoSQL systems force you to do this denormalization up front. Um, if you use a search engine like uh, Elasticsearch or something like that, you probably also have had to join together um, different uh, items from, or uh, uh, data from different entities in your system. And then, of course, every analytical system on the planet, almost by definition, is a join together of lots of different entities. Anyway, so I, I show these examples because if this back here did not look familiar, hopefully it feels a little bit more familiar when you think of it as metaphors of other systems that you use. Okay, uh, that's for that. So finally, the uh, most complicated one, and um, the most emotionally fraught, I think. Um, I will, uh, I th I'm really gonna only be able to do a sketch, like let's ask lots of questions and so on and have, a, have the full conversation that we can have in the time that we have. Um, I will also give you some pointers at the end to places that you can learn more about the pattern I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest. So the pattern here, well, okay. So the problem statement is in a monolithic relational database, I can do transactions across mul multiple entities. Like that's one of the great things about relational databases in the beginning. So I could begin a transaction, I could insert into table A, update table B, commit, and that is ACID. So it is atomic, consistent, isolated, durable. It either all happens or it doesn't happen at all. So once I have split data across services, those transact doing those transactions is really hard. In fact, please don't do it. So there exists in the world a thing called two-phase commit. Um, most people at, at serious scale don't use that, uh, that thing. Distributed coordination exists as a theoretical approach. As a practical matter, it is very challenging because it is a huge performance uh, slowdown on your system. And as Pat Helland, the guy who implemented it for SQL Server says, it's the anti-availability protocol. So if you do a two-phase commit across multiple uh, resources is the, is the technical term, across multiple databases or whatever, um, they all have to be up for that to happen, right? So even if the coordination, yeah, the coordination is slow and it might not complete at all. So, okay, two-phase, and the other way to think about it is um, there is no cloud provider on the planet that offers distributed transactions because nobody does it at scale, so that's why. Okay, cool, so don't do that, but do this. 
Um, so instead, let's take this thing that we would like to have as an acid transaction and turn it into a workflow, or the fancy term is a saga, of a bunch of individual atomic events. So let's imagine, let's model the transaction as a state machine of doing an update to A, then an update to B, then an update to C. So uh, let's think of it as, okay, so I update A, and that starts off a chain of events, starts off a state machine that, where the transition is, you know, A does its thing, it produces an event, B listens to that event, it does its thing, it produces one or maybe several events, and then C does its thing. So, does this conceptually make sense at the moment? Like I'm doing one, I'm starting a chain reaction. I'm starting a, a state machine, and my first step in my state, you know, my first state in that machine is update A, and then transition, update B, transition, update C. And you say, well, that's all cool, Randy, but what about when things go wrong? That's a great question, I'm glad you asked. The way that you do that in this model is you kind of roll it back by applying the undo operations and the reverse. Does it make sense, at least conceptually? So let's imagine there's a failure that happens in the C point, you know, at the C sta uh, uh, state, the C step in the state machine. Um, and so C says, oh, that's not good. So it's gonna send the sort of up, uh, undo yourself event uh, back to B. B will, up, it will undo itself and then it will send some events back to A um, and they will update uh, themselves. Does it at least conceptually make sense? If it seems complicated, I'm sh it legitimately does uh, look that way at first glance. Again, I want to disabuse you of the notion that this is entirely new and novel and weird because there are lots of common systems that you use every day that work exactly like this. So the funny thing for distributed systems people is that the canonical example of distributed transactions is a thing that nobody uses for distributed transactions in the real world. So the canonical example is let's withdraw money from Michelle's account and pay it into Randy's account. And what we're going to do is we're going to start a transaction, we're going to debit Michelle's account, we're going to uh, add to Randy's account, and then we're gonna uh, commit the transaction. There are exactly zero financial systems on the planet that work that way. What they actually do is a workflow. So Michelle says, I would like to pay Randy $30. Um, it leaves her pocket, so she doesn't have access to it. It spends three days in the financial services industry, building the, 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 um, the buildings that I was just at in New York and NASDAQ you know, the day before yesterday, um, you know, building everything that is Wall Street uh, on top of that, um, and then finally after three days, you know, it ends up in my account. Um, but that's a workflow. Does it make sense? Um, also, expense reports. So um, uh, Cerner was very kind to you know, bring me here and arrange my travel, but um, they didn't know that I was gonna go to eat at uh, Jack Stack yesterday for lunch. They didn't know that ahead of time, so I'm gonna submit you know, my, uh, my receipts, and um, that will not give me my money back immediately, and I'm not feeling bad about that. Like, I know this is totally fine. No worries, no, no worries Brittany, it's fine. Um, but like, I will submit those receipts. They will get approved by, you know, Brittany will say that looks legit. Um, and then that will go to her boss and her boss and her boss, et cetera, all the way up. Um, and then finally it will be approved and then they'll start a payment workflow and then three days later, you know, I'll get my money and that's fine. Um, does that start to feel familiar now? So what it is not is an acid transaction. So it is not A, atomic. It is not C, consistent. It is not I, isolated. It is D, durable. Um, but what it is is um, the terminal states in this state machine are either nothing happened or it, all the way, it went all the way to completion. Does it make sense? Um, yeah, so you can observe interim states. Like you can, it's not transactional, it's not atomic. So one could ask, one Randy could legitimately ask, hey Michelle, what's the state of my payment? And the answer would be, it is pending. It's pending. But that's legit, right? That's actually a legit thing. It's like, it's not not paid, it is, but it's not yet paid. Does it make sense? So this, I'm telling you this because if you decide to take something that is currently transactional and turn it into this model, you do have metaphors that are meaningful even to non-technical people about being able to observe these interim states. Does it make sense? Like, oh, the payment, it's just, we're still processing your payment. Like it's pending or it's processing or it's in process. Like we have ways of thinking about that. Um, the other fun analogy that I like to use is, all right, who writes code for a living? I hope many, yeah, more people write, cool. 
m a lot of people, like I wish I could say I did, but I, you know, whatever. Um, so I used to. Uh, so all right, many, many hands uh, went up. Um, raise your hand if when you hit return in your IDE, it is immediately and atomically uh, deployed to production. Let the record show that no hands went up. Uh, right, you laugh, but that's a process. Why? Because you're gonna, you're gonna say, I'm done, you're gonna compile in your, in your IDE, you're gonna uh, check it in, it's gonna get code reviewed, um, it's gonna go through some CI process, I hope, it's gonna go through your de deployment pipeline, and even if it were super fast, it's gonna take a while between the time when you, you know, were done on your IDE to having that code show up in production. And so, I'm not to make anybody feel bad, but if you're like, I can't deal with a system where it's inconsistent, like, yeah, you super can, you do it every day. Does it make sense? Like, I can't deal with an inconsistent system. Yes, you can. Is the code on your machine different than in production? It totally is. Is that inconsistent? It certainly is. Can you reason about it? You certainly can, <laughs> right? Cool, all right. Uh, so the last thing I will leave you with, and then we'll hopefully have a few moments for questions, is, um, this event processing that we're talking about here is really lightweight. It's stateless in a lot of these situations, and it's triggered by an event. So what, what A does when, it's, when we start this you know, state machine is I say, I don't know, uh, process this order. And it goes, OK, well, store this thing in my database and update myself and then like fire an event. And that's what the A does. And that's, pretty, that's stateless logic. I mean, there's state, but it's in, not in me. It's in my database. So, uh, and it's stateless and it's triggered by an event. So, because we're in 2017 and serverless is a thing, this is a legitimate use for serverless. Is it the only way to implement it? Absolutely not. But, if you want to think about where could functions as a service or serverless like be a part of a microservices architecture or part of an event-driven architecture, like this is a great example. Does it make sense? Again, stateless logic, super lightweight, maybe 10 lines or tens of lines of code, not very much code for a bunch of these things. Um, and so a function as a service approach is a really le a legitimate one. Does this make sense? Cool, all right. So what we learned is with microservices, we can do shared data, we can do joins, we can't do transactions, but we can do something that you know, has some of the same effects and actually sometimes gives us some advantages about being able to observe and report on uh, pending states. So thanks a lot. So I think we have a few moments for questions and Brittany will be tossing the cool fuzzy microphone around if anybody wants to ask them. Gadget? Hello. Hello. Hey, so when you're doing um, the, these transactions and you've got like A that ri then writes to B, um, how do you handle somebody reading from A and B before B is written to? How do you handle somebody reading from A and B? So they're, they're observing an interim state. Right, so let's say like I, I place an order on a website, but I've updated my credit card information and like my billing information. So my address has changed, but my credit card information hasn't changed yet. I won't be able to place an order until they're both done because it's not atomic. How yeah. would you handle that in this model? Yeah, uh, I, mean, the honest, I mean the honest answer is like given a particular use case, we could talk through the way to handle it. Um, Having, if to the extent you care about the A thing and the B thing being very tightly coordinated, then I think the way to think about that is it's a pending situation. So you could imagine, and this is actually true of financial stuff, like your address change is pending because maybe we haven't fully communicated it to everybody. Like that's a, you know, I'm get, that's a way of thinking about it. Um, if you are, if you have the ability to reason about this is a pending change, um, that's a way that gets you out of a lot of the, I'll say, slightly artificial feeling that you need consistency. Another strategy is, I like to think of it as um, valid as of. So you could ask the system, um, let's see, address changes don't work that well in that way. Um, what's a good example? Um, you ask this, I'm, I'm struggling with the example, but you ask the system, tell me the current state of this thing. And it responds with, the state was as of noon on 
what are we at, Thursday the 7th or whatever, like as of noon Thursday the 7th, the state was this. Does it make sense? So we not, I don't know what it is at 2 p.m., but I do know what it was at noon. Does that make sense? So that's like the valid as of. Um, and actually, at, again, I'm trying to buy a house, so like I was actually looking at some financial things this morning to get some information to my loan people. Um, and so what you will see on the financial stuff is they'll say, here's how much, you know, you have, you know, $5 in your account, Randy. Um, but it'll say, like, as of this date, like that's big, you know, in big, bold letters, like as of whatever, this morning at 6 a.m. as a market open, like this is how much uh, your portfolio is worth. Does it make sense? It's a great question. I mean, that's the real question, right? That's what, that's what you have never had to think about with, with transactions, and now you have to think about what happens when somebody observes these interim states. Yeah. Okay, uh, when you are isolating your database from your shared database, right, what do you do with the legacy data? Do you migrate all that information over separately, or does it go along with in that same that's a great question, yeah. So what do you do with the, with the historical data? Um, it's an interesting and great question, so the answer is always it depends. The normal case is you do migrate it over. Um, I have also seen clever implementations where in an intermediate, so obviously when, if you want to completely get off the monolithic database, obviously you have to move all the data at some point. And typically I've seen, and there are lots of ways to do it, um, typically I've seen that done where you his migrate things historically. Let me see if I can get this, this uh, timing right. You migrate everything historically. You then flip, oh, and then you write to both. Yeah, you have to do a write for a little pe interim period. And then when you are comfortable that the new place is up to date and is constantly being written to, then you can turn off the thing that writes to the old thing and you can retire it. Does that make sense? There are actually other ways to do it. There's actually a dual read strategy that I've seen some people do where for old things you read from the old place and the new things you read from the new place. That doesn't allow you to get off the, that monolithic database, but that's a legit, that's actually a legit thing to do in, the, in that interim phase as well, like maybe when you're migrating. Does it make sense? Yep. Yeah, good question. What, have you ever encountered resistance to splitting data out of a database due to the loss of like referential integrity in the database doing the consistency checks? And if so, what was your response? To that? Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, hey, you took away, I worked, finally, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember this. I remember when Oracle introduced referential integrity in Oracle 6. Uh, I was working there at the time. Um, so that's how old I am. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, hey, you took away my referential integrity. Yep. That sucks, I mean, it totally sucks. It does suck. I'm not gonna, I, no, what, what else can I say? Uh, what you get, well, what you get is the scalability and like, you know, independent deployability and moving fast, uh, and you have to give things up. Yeah, referential integrity is one thing. Um, you will not get immediate enforcement of ref referential integrity because that's, a, that's another distributed coordination problem, right? Um, but what you can have is a kind of optimistic concurrency approach to it where like, I'm about to, um, what? I'm about to create this order. Let's make sure that the customer I'm creating it for still exists for example, something like that. The more common case is the delete cascade idea where like I wanna delete the customer and then I want all her orders to also be deleted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is actually, typically those things are um, very amenable to events. Does it make sense? Like you delete the customer and like that triggers, that fires an event and then everybody else listens to it. Like, oh, we delete this customer so I better delete all, my, all that customer's orders. Does it make sense? Yeah, great question though. I mean, and the legit answer is, yeah, we took a thing that was super easy and convenient and we made it inconvenient. All right, I'm getting the hook. But uh, thanks, it's a great, uh, great audience, great set of questions. So go forth and continue saving lives, people.